contact forces and friction. When two objects interact by touching, the interaction is a contact force. Normal forces and friction forces are both contact forces. These forces are perpendicular to each other. Another word for that is orthogonal. If the object is sliding, it is a friction force. If the object has no motion, it's a static force. So the coefficient of friction, this is mu sub k, is the ratio of the frictional force to the normal force. So this is a kinetic frictional force divided by your normal force. This is a static friction force divided by your normal force. Again, kinetic friction is friction that is in motion. Static friction is friction that is not moving. The object is at rest. The kinetic force is proportional to the magnitude of your normal force. So if your kinetic force is large, then your normal force is large. If your kinetic force is small, your normal force is small. It's independent of the speed of the surfaces. And it's also independent of the area of contact between the surfaces. One last thing. The coefficient of static friction or the coefficient of kinetic friction is unitless. So the normal friction, I'm sorry, the normal force determines friction. So if the static friction is less then are equal to the coefficient of static friction times the normal force, then there's basically no movement. Now, when you reach the maximum static friction, that object that you're pulling or pushing starts to move from rest, okay? And when it starts to move, it's no longer at rest. It's no longer static friction. So that's the maximum static friction. And when you're sliding, then that, of course, is kinetic friction. F sub k equals mu sub k times n. The frictional and normal forces are components. Here's your frictional force. Here's your normal force. And their vector forces or vector components of this contact force, which is the resultant. So we need to be able to find frictional forces given the mass of the object and the nature of the surfaces in contact with each other. So there are two areas of friction. When an object is sliding with respect to a surface, you have kinetic friction force. When there is no motion, there's static friction force. So you should be very clear now on your frictional forces. So remember, when F sub S or static friction is less than or equal to the product of mu sub S times your normal force, there's no movement. When you reach F sub S max, it's just starting to move. And kinetic friction is sliding with friction, mu sub k times n. Now let's look how the friction changes as the forces change. Forces from static friction increase as the force increases, while forces from kinetic friction are relatively constant. So if we look at A, there's no applied force. The box is at rest. There's no friction. So F sub S equals zero. When you go to B, 
you have a very weak force and the box remains at rest. So it's still at static friction, it's not moving. But when you apply a stronger force and it's just about to slide, then that's when you're reaching that maximum static friction, like in C. So for D, now the box is sliding at a constant speed and you have kinetic friction. So friction, a lot of times you'll hear that something was sliding on a smooth surface. But unless your problem tells you to ignore friction, there's always going to be some type of friction because if you look at this on a microscopic level, even smooth surfaces are rough and they tend to catch on to the object and to cling on to the object. So surface will always have imperfections. Your perception of them depends on the magnification. The coefficient of friction will reveal how much force is involved. Next, we'll look at inclined surfaces. Now, you have an X and a Y axis. We've been talking about displacement on X and Y axis, forces on X and Y axis. But what happens when that X and Y axis tilt? When they tilt, you have what's called an inclined surface. Now the normal force is still perpendicular or orthogonal to that surface, whether it's tilted or not, it's perpendicular to that surface. And the weight is still vertically downward. So when the weight is parallel to the surface, like here and here, because this is the same surface, it's just a mirror image, then W sine theta equals mg sine theta because W equals mg. And when the weight is orthogonal to the surface, then, and that's here where the weight is perpendicular, and this is the mirror image of that perpendicular weight. Then it's negative W cosine theta because it's in the downward Y direction. So here we have a box sliding down the plane. So Y perpendicular and Y parallel are the components of this weight vector. So y perpendicular equals w sub y, which is negative w cosine theta, which equals mg negative cosine theta, because it's adjacent over hypotenuse. If we look at the perpendicular y, we're concerned about this angle here. Let me draw an arrow because that's how much it was tilted from the y-axis. So we're looking, if we look at that angle, then that angle is adjacent to W perpendicular, and that's gonna be over the hypotenuse, which is cosine. And for a parallel weight, here, if we look at the mirror image here, wow, parallel weight, that is opposite to that angle of the hypotenuse, which gives you a sine 
So here we have a toboggan on a steep hill with friction. Okay, so you see the same image here that we just looked at on the previous slide, and you'll see a better image on the next slide. And if you look at the forces in the x direction, you have mg, which is weight, sine, in this case the angle is alpha. So mg sine alpha, which is here, we're analyzing the forces in the x direction. So over here, in the negative x direction, you have F sub K. So you have mg sine theta plus negative F sub K equals mg sine alpha, sorry, alpha plus negative mu sub K F times the normal force. Because if you remember, F sub K equals mu sub k times n. And in this case, it's negative because it's in the negative x direction. So if we look at now the forces in the y direction, we have your normal force here, plus mg cosine alpha, because w equals mg. It's in the negative y direction, so we're going to make that mg negative. So n plus negative mg cosine alpha equals zero. And of course, mu sub k is going to be the sine of alpha over the cosine of alpha, which is tangent alpha. So here's the same image again. We see the forces in the x direction. Mg, which is w. sine theta equals mass times acceleration in the x direction. The forces in the y direction are your normal force n plus, and you have your negative w cosine theta, which is why you have a negative sign here because it's in the downward direction on the y-axis. And again, w equals m times g. And as we look at acceleration in the x direction, acceleration is g sine theta, okay, which is the same as if you put that m there, mg sine, in this case the angle is called alpha, which matches this. All right, so let's look at a problem. You have a car engine with a weight, and that weight is signified or denoted by a lowercase w. It hangs from a chain that is linked at point O, which is here, to two other chains, one fastened to the ceiling and the other to the wall. Find the tension in each of the three chains assuming that W is given and the weights of the chains are negligible. Now I'm going to, right here at the top, 
for right now, we're going to say that the weight is 2200 newtons, but we're not going to worry about that right now. So you have two free body diagrams. This one is for the engine, and this is for the O-ring. So we want to find the tension in each of the three chains, assuming that W is given and the weights of the chains are negligible. Okay, so let's look at the forces in the X direction. If we start here, we're going to look at the O-ring first. If we start in the X direction on the positive side, you see T3 cosine 60. So let's write that first. F sub X equals T Three cosine 60. You keep going to the left on the x-axis, you'll see T2. So that's in the negative x direction. So I'm just going to write, you can write plus negative T sub 2, or you can just write minus T sub 2. And we're going to set that equal to 0. Then we're going to add T2 to both sides. And you get T sub 3 cosine 60 equals T sub 2. So I probably need to get a new pen because this is not working well. Let's see, I'm going to pull up my eraser. Let's see if I can write that a little neater. All right, so we have T3 cosine 60 equals T sub 2. As you look on the left on the sheet of paper, you'll see that right here. So now we look at our forces in the Y direction. And we start again at the top. This is at the top. So we have T3 sine 60, and you go down and you see T1 here, so, and that's in the negative y direction, so I'm going to put minus T sub 1 equals 0, and when I rewrite that, I'll have T sub 3 cosine 60 equals T sub 1. As you see on the sheet of paper to the left here. So the question is, what is T sub 3? 
Okay, great. Fresh and So T sub three then is going to be, if you consider the equations that we just came up with, T sub three is going to be, if you rewrite this equation here, T sub three is T sub one over sine 60. Okay, and T sub one, that's weight. Okay, so I'm just going to change that T sub one for right now to weight over sine sixty. And let's remember from algebra, even though we don't see it, there's a one in front of that W. And that one, even though my pen is a little challenged, there we are. So one W over sine 60. So you take the sine of 60 and the inverse of that, or one divided by sine of 60, and you'll get that T sub 3 equals 1.155 W. Don't forget to put, <coughs> excuse me, don't forget to make that W a little neater. Okay, so that's T sub 3. Now, we need to find T sub two. And if you remember, T sub two, let's go at the top of this page, equals T three cosine 60. So T sub two equals, we just found T sub three, cosine, 60, and that equals 0 0.577 W. All right. And we already saw earlier that T sub 1 from this equation again, I'll draw an arrow on the page, is T3 sine 60. So T3 is 1.155 sine 60. And that equals 1.0 zero zero W. Okay. So now you have T sub one here. You have T sub two here and T sub three here. Now you're going to take the fact that the engine's weight W equals 2200 newtons. And you're going to plug that in for all the W's. So I'm going to erase this screen. Well, I really don't need to erase it. Look over to the left. And when you plug in 2200 times T sub 1, which is 1.000, you get 2200 newtons. For T sub 2, 0 0.577 times 2200 gives you 1,270 newtons. And for T sub 3, 1.155 times 2200 newtons 
gives you 2,540 newtons. And that makes sense, because when you think about T sub 3, which if you look up at the image to your right at the top, T sub 3 has to have a magnitude that's larger than W so that its vertical component can be equal in magnitude to W in order to hold up that engine. Okay? All right, I'm trying to take my time to make sure everyone gets this. Next problem. Ignoring the weight of the cable and friction in the pulley and wheels, determine how weights one and two must be related for the system to move with constant speed. So basically for this problem, we're gonna look at the weight of the bucket and the weight of the cart to see how those weights are related to keep that cart moving as the string pulls the weight over the pulley on the bucket. So here you have the free body diagram for the bucket. And here you have the free body diagram for the cart. Okay, so if we look at the cart, let's look at the cart first. And let's analyze the forces for the cart in the X direction. So you see, starting here in the X direction, you'll see T and you see W sub one sine 15. And W one sub one sine 15 is in the negative X direction, right? So that force analysis should look like this, T minus W sub 1 sine 15. Then you're going to add W sub 1 sine 15 to both sides because those forces equal 0, right? So when you add on to both sides, you get T equals W1 sine 15. Okay, and now we looked at that in the X direction because if, as you look at the cart, it's moving in the X direction. Now the bucket, that's moving in the y direction. So we're going to look at the forces of the bucket in the y direction, which is simply T minus W2 equals zero. Then we're gonna add W2 to both sides, so we end up with T equals W sub 2. Okay, so as we look at the sheet to the left, remember we're comparing the weight of the bucket and the cart to see the relationship between the two. So we're going to take W1 sine 15 and make that equal to W2. Well, the sine of 15 is 0 0.26. 
And for W2, there's that one there. So if you look at that, that tells you that weight one is about a fourth of the size of weight two. So weight two is larger than weight one, which makes sense because it needs to be in order to move that cart up that incline. There you go. Next problem I'm giving to you as homework. Work on it on your own, a cart, a car, sorry, with a weight of 1.76 times 10 to the fourth newtons rests on the ramp of a trailer. The car's brakes and transmission lock are released. Only the cable prevents the car from rolling backward off the trailer. The ramp makes an angle of 26 degrees with the horizontal. Find the tension in the cable and the force with which the ramp pushes on the car tires. So a free body diagram has been provided for you. This is for the car. For a clue, to find the tension in the cable, you want to analyze the forces in the X direction. And for the ramp, analyze your forces in the Y direction. Okay? How much effort to move the crate? Well, let's first recall the equations for static friction and for kinetic friction. Mu sub s stands in for your coefficient of static friction, and mu sub k times in for your coefficient of kinetic friction. Delivery company has just unloaded a 500 newton crate, that's your force, full of home exercise equipment in your level driveway. You find that to get it started moving towards your garage, you have to pull with a horizontal force of magnitude of 230 newtons. Once the crate breaks loose and starts to move, you can keep it moving at a constant velocity with only 200 newtons of force. So what are the coefficients of static and kinetic friction? So you want to solve for mu sub s and mu sub k. So you have to rewrite the equation, which means you're going to make mu sub s equal f sub s over n and mu sub k equals f sub k over n. So as you analyze your forces, n minus w, then you add w to both sides, you get n equals 500 newtons, okay? Because the force is the weight. Then you have tension minus your static friction equals zero, add f sub s to both sides, and you have f sub s equals 230 newtons because the problem told you that that was a tension. So now in order to get that coefficient of static friction, you simply divide F sub S by N. So you get F mu sub S equals 0 0.46. No units because coefficients of friction, static or kinetic, are unitless. Do the same process for the coefficient of kinetic friction.
And what if it's at an angle? The previous example has one new step. The force is applied at an angle, which is 30 degrees. So the sum of the forces in the x direction are t cosine 30, okay, plus negative f sub k, so it's going to be negative 0 0.40. And F sub K is mu sub K times N equals zero. Let's look at the forces in the Y direction. You have your normal force plus T sine 30. Then you have your weight. So your normal force equals 500 minus T sine 30. How do we get that? We added W to both sides and we subtracted T sine 30 from both sides. So it's N equals 500 which is your W minus your T sine 30. Okay, plug and show your values. Now you have your values plugged in, solve for T. Then plug T into your second equation. Here, to get N. So play with that problem a little bit, and your tension T should be 188 newtons, and your normal force should be 406 newtons. Now let's talk about your lungs. Whenever you breathe in, your lungs expand. When you breathe out, they compress. So they kind of obey what's called Hooke's Law. Your lungs have a surface tension and tissue elasticity. They create a spring-like property, like a spring that you stretch and compress, which assists with exhalation and opposes inhalation. So the more you inhale, the greater the force is required to exhale. You can try this at home, of course. So diseases like emphysema and pulmonary fibrosis can change that effective force. The proportionality of force to stretching and compressing is called Hooke's Law. Hooke's law is the force of a spring equals K, which is called the spring constant, times your change in the length, the length from when something is stretched or compressed. If it's compressed, then it will have a negative sign in front of that K constant. The units of the spring constant is newtons per meter.
So just like a spring, when it's compressed, or let's consider a spring, when it's compressed or pushed together, you let it go and it bounces back because it wants to go to a state where it was before you pushed it, which is called the state of equilibrium. And the same thing, when you stretch that spring out and you let it go, it bounces right back to its initial position because it wants to go back to its position or state of equilibrium. So if you have a stiff spring, then you're gonna have a really large spring constant, okay? Because it requires a large force to stretch or compress that spring. The spring constant, K, is always positive. Remember, it's like gravity is always positive. Gravity is always positive unless you have a downward acceleration vector. In this case, the spring constant is always positive unless you're compressing it. The sign will tell you which direction the spring is moving. Which brings us to elastic forces. Springs or other elastic material will exert force when stretched or compressed. The magnitude of the spring force is given by Hooke's law, where the spring constant K and the change in length is the distance the spring is stretched or compressed from its equilibrium length. So as you look at the image, the top image has a spring that is in its equilibrium position. It's just sitting there at rest. When you pull that spring or you stretch it, you stretch it a specific distance. Okay, that's gonna be your change in length. When you let it go, it's gonna go back to its state of equilibrium. So the magnitude of the spring force is proportional to the displacement. So the more force you apply to that spring, the greater the displacement will take place on that spring. So the spring force points opposite to the direction of displacement in the image D. Here it's being compressed in the negative x direction. When you let it go, it wants to go back to its state of equilibrium. Let's look at another problem. A surgeon is using material from a donated heart to repair a patient's damaged aorta and needs to know the elastic characteristics of this aortal material. So tests performed on a 16 centimeter strip of the donated aorta reveal that it stretches 3.75 centimeters when a 1.50 Newton pull is exerted on it. A, what is this force, K, spring constant, of this strip of aortal material? B, if the maximum distance it will be able to stretch when it replaces the order in the damaged heart is 1.14 centimeters, what is the greatest force it will be able to exert there? A lot of words, don't let the words confuse you. Look at what it's asking you for. In A, it's asking you for the spring constant In B, it's asking you for the force. And you know the equation for Hooke's law is F sub 
SPR equals K del L. So if you want to find the spring constant, you're going to rearrange this equation to solve for K. So the force is 1.50 newtons divided by 0 0.0375 meters because we always change the units to the basic SI units. So it was centimeters in the problem, so we wanted meters when we're working out the problem. And that will give you a spring constant of 40 newtons per meter. For B, they want to know the force. Well, you've got the change in the distance of stretching, which you converted to meters, and you multiply that times K. Why? Because the equation for a spring equals K del, I really need to get a new pen, L. Del L is 0 0.0114 meters. You multiply that times the spring constant you found in A, and you get 0 0.456 newtons. So again, a lot of words in the problem. Don't let the words scare you or confuse you. It's just a matter of looking at what you're given, looking at the formula you're going to use, and how to plug and chug. Again, this chapter is about applications of Newton's laws, which is why we've had so many problems to work on. A three kilogram mass and a 10 kilogram mass are attached to each other by a spring with a spring constant of 500 Newtons per meter and placed on a frictionless table. The masses are then pressed toward each other in such a way as to compress the spring 0 0.05 meters. So you have masses, you have a spring constant, and you have a length or change in length. This says calculate the magnitude and direction of the acceleration of each mass the moment they are released. So 500 newtons per meter, that's your spring constant, 0 0.05 meters, that's the spring compressed to the right, divided by the mass of 3 kilograms. At the top, you will see that equation for acceleration. And you'll end up with negative 8 meters per second squared. Then you do the same thing, exact same thing, but this time you plug in the mass 10 kilograms. And you get an acceleration of positive 2.5 meters per second squared. So negative eight meters per second squared means that the spring is compressed to the right, but when you use three kilograms, it's going to move back to the left at eight meters per second squared. When you use 10 kilograms, it's going to spring to the right 2.5 meters per second squared. There are a variety of forces in nature. Gravitational interactions, those are interactions that get weaker as the distance increases. So as the further out you go in the universe, the weaker the gravity gets, but it never gets to zero.
You have weight, which is Earth gravitational pull acting on mass. You have the maintenance of planets that revolve around the sun. They need gravity to continue their revolutions. Then you have electromagnetic interactions, which are not just in physics, in the laboratory, but also in the human body. You have your heart, you have your brain, and you have your nerve synapses. They all act on electrical impulses. So we don't just consider electromagnetic interactions as interactions between charged particles, po positive and negative charges in electric and magnetic fields, but also in human anatomy. Then you have strong interactions, interactions that hold protons and neutrons together in a nucleus. Those subatomic particles are actually called gluons. And just like the name sounds, they act like glue to hold the particles together. There are several other subatomic particles, quarks, hadrons, leptons, um, muons, uh, not just protons and neutrons and electrons. There's several more that have strong interactions. Nuclear forces, forces that bind elementary particles and combinations. Then you have weak interactions. And then that deals when that comes about when you have nuclear radioactive decay taking place, like beta, alpha, and gamma particles. This last slide is just a summary of all the equations that we covered in chapter five. So uh, good luck studying and going over that one problem for homework. And I will talk to you again tomorrow when we start to cover chapter six. Have a good evening.